Welcome to Flat, Cool, and Acid Free, an OK State Archives podcast, bringing you stories about Oklahoma State University and Oklahoma. I'm Nina Thornton, multimedia producer for the OSU Libraries. On this episode... So they were, they were very involved in, in society and academic life, uh, almost from the very beginning. Um, our, our first, Bonnie uh, Kane Wood and David Peters talk about the women of OSU. David, when OAMC first opened, what kind of roles did women play? Well, let's talk about before OAMC first opened. Um, so uh, there were four landowners, actually four, three couples and, and an, a bachelor who gave land to establish the campus, all right? And I think sometimes we forget the three couples. There was Elizabeth and Alfred Gerald, so Elizabeth was involved, uh, Sarah and Oscar Morris, and then Martha and Charles Vreeland. So Elizabeth, Sarah, uh, and Martha also participated in deeding over parts of their property. And those three couples accounted for 160 acres of our first 200 acres. So I think women had a role even before the college uh, opened. Uh, when the campus um, begins enrollment for their first classes, that's in December of uh, 1891, uh, about half of the first cohort uh, are women. Um, wow. And so uh, many of the students were in the preparatory program, which was kind of a pre-college program, because they were coming from areas that didn't have high schools, they didn't have diplomas, mm -hmm. so they had to go through the preparatory program. But about half of the students who first enrolled uh, were, were women. Um, and so we even had a, a woman on our first faculty, Ella Hunter, uh, was our first faculty member, uh, and she served in the, in the preparatory program. So, Wow, so right from the very beginning, right women very, very beginning. involved with mm -hmm. our campus. Wonderful. So as the years went on, how did the role of women change on campus? So um, I think they took advantage of opportunities that were made available to them, and sometimes they made the opportunities uh, for themselves. Uh, there was an honorary society, an honorary literary society called the Webster Society. Well, that honorary site was just for men. So what the women did is they created a second uh, literary, honorary literary society, and that was the Sigma Literary Society, and that was available for women. Their founders were women, but they made it available to men and women, uh, and so they were, they were very inclusive whenever they started an organization. Uh, the Sigmas also had a, a singing group, the Sigma Serenaders, uh, and so uh, they were active in that. Um, uh, women was also, the Sigma Serenaders co-ed as well? It was co-ed as well. Okay. Um, and so um, uh, also the, uh, we had women uh, as part of our other, other faculties as programs were developing in academia. Uh, women were actively involved when the college paper first starts in 1895 mm -hmm. with submitting articles and having their, their materials published. Um, and so they were, they were very involved in, in society and academic life uh, almost from the very beginning. Um, our, our first um, uh, award winner for academic achievement was a woman. Uh, Kate Neal received the very first Magruder uh, Prize, Magruder Medal, uh, that was in 1893. So wow. they're, they're integrated into academia and they're active uh, in society. And, and, and she was part of that first she cohort. She was part of that first cohort. And, and she would have been a, a member of the first class. Uh, her father was the head of the experiment station, uh, James Neal. He died in December uh, of her senior year and her mother took uh, her and her sister back to Tennessee, and so she missed graduating with the first class mm -hmm. by one semester. Uh, and another member of what would have been the first class was Jessie Thatcher Bost. Mm -hmm. She took a year off because of illness, and so she would have also been in that first class of 1896, but she then is our first graduate in 1897. Mm -hmm. And that very first graduating class was pretty small, right? Well, there, there were only six. So of all six those, in the there, first there were roughly 60, class. some who started about. 30 or so were in the first college level uh, mm -hmm. group, uh, and only six uh, reached, uh, reached graduation. Uh, but there was, um, this was a new area, it's recently mm -hmm. settled, there was kind of a high turnover, because uh, right. people are coming and going, uh, and, and uh, so uh, we had a retention issue init initially, but uh, we've made improvements since then, so. Wonderful. So since we are here in Williams, uh, Willard Hall, can you tell us a little bit more about this building and why we maybe chose this for our women's history episode? So uh, Willard Hall was named for Frances Willard. Uh, Frances mm -hmm. Willard was an uh, activist uh, early on in the temperance uh, activities and also with voting uh, and women's leadership uh, across mm -hmm. the United States. 
And so the local and state temperance leagues mm -hmm. uh, supported the naming of this residence hall for uh, Francis Willard. Uh, it was our second women's dormitory on this side of campus. In fact, uh, it was well, it was built in 1939, I think occupied in, in September of 1939. Uh, but it and Murray Hall uh, were women's residence halls. And so okay. women, uh, their residence halls ended up being on the west side of campus, uh -huh. uh, and the men were kept on the east side. Uh, of How campus, so they were separated uh, that way. It was also it's it's uh, it's almost ex a duplicate of of um, I believe it's Murray Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, most most of the furniture here was made in in the local shop on campus, um, but it was uh, it was to recognize uh, first of all Francis Willard's uh, impact uh, nationwide. In fact, it was one of our early buildings uh, named for uh, a woman. The other uh, early residence hall was uh, Jesse Thatcher uh, Boss mm -hmm. uh, Thatcher Hall. Okay. Uh, it was still in existence. It was, it was originally a women's residence hall, but when they built Willard, most of the women moved out of Thatcher um, mm -hmm. and it became a men's dormitory. Um, but it was named for Jesse Thatcher Bost, our first graduate. So Wonderful. Um, and there are, there are a few buildings like Willard and Thatcher on campus that were formerly residence halls that have now been turned into academic buildings, correct? Right, right. And Thatcher is another example. Uh, Willard was actually, uh, it's one of the last, uh, what they call traditional residence mm -hmm. halls to remain active. It was active until 1986. I didn't realize it had been active that long. Oh, wow. And so there were, there were graduates or women of Willard yeah. uh, attending all the way through, I think it was spring of 1986. Uh, and then eventually, of course, it's been converted now to, to use by this, uh, what was the College of Education. So, David, let's talk a little bit about campus organizations. We mentioned the Sigma Literary Society. Okay. What are some other important women's groups that we have had on campus? So, um, uh, there was a women's suffragette club uh, mm -hmm. beginning in 1913. Uh -huh. um, and they were actually involved in, in getting women the right to vote. Remember, women don't have the right to vote yeah. until 1920. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they're actively involved with that. Uh, La Homa Club. Um, uh, La Homa was, was made up of women who mostly were spouses of many of the male faculty members on campus. Uh, and they promoted a scholarship uh, um, uh, for, for all, uh, mostly women. They, mm -hmm. they encouraged uh, academic achievement by women. Um, there was the, uh, um, oh, let's see, Efakoa, or I'm not sure how to say it. It later became Mortarboard. Um, but Wonderful. it was established in 1929 to support uh, academic and leadership uh, achievement and goals for seniors, uh, senior women. Mm -hmm. And later they went on to expand that to freshmen and sophomores to kind of nurture them along. Uh, and then they later become uh, what we know as, as mortar board. Um, let's see, what else? I'm, I know I'm, I'm forgetting several here. Um, oh, there was a Women's Self-Government Association, which is kind of interesting. It also developed in the, late, okay. in, in the late 20s. Uh, they were representatives from each of the sororities, mm -hmm. representatives from, from each of the women's residence halls. Most of the women's uh, groups on campus, like the YWCA, the mm -hmm. Young uh, Women's uh, uh, Christian Association, uh, Kappa Phi, which is another uh, religious organization for women. So all of those groups, if, if they involve women, had a representative on this women's self-government uh, uh, okay. association. Um, and they actively um, uh, were involved with, with helping women understand both uh, campus policies, which impacted mm -hmm. them, <clears throat> but then also uh, other policies in the state and nation, which also might impact them. So an uh, interesting group of women, uh, once again, always making sure they were inclusive of anyone who might mm -hmm. be uh, uh, might be uh, interested or involved. Um, I'm trying to think. That's, that's probably enough for now. That, that's uh, to give you an, an idea. Okay. Well, you mentioned the sororities were mm -hmm. involved in this, um, and now we just uh, sororities are kind of part of campus life. But when did sororities start here at OSU? Surely not from the very, very beginning. <laughs> no, not from the very beginning. But uh, officially, they didn't begin until about 1919. Okay. So let's let's backtrack a little bit. Um, most people don't realize that students enrolling here until the teens, 1915, 1916, signed uh, an oath that they would not be a member of a secret society or a secret organization. So all students signed that. So they couldn't officially be a part of a secret society, which fraternities and sororities were considered secret societies. But of course, if it was secret, <coughs> they wouldn't have told. They wouldn't have told, and, and they would sign the oath uh, and then keep it a secret. Um, but beginning about 1911, 1912, 1913, right in there, 
uh, small groups of women began meeting uh, clandestinely uh, at various locations both on and off campus. Mm -hmm. And some of them were meeting at uh, the homes of uh, women faculty members who had probably been members of a national organization mm -hmm. uh, that they were trying to affiliate with. Um, they all kept it under wraps and, and I think it, it eventually it becomes the groups that we know as Kappa Delta, uh, Kappa Alpha Theta, uh, uh, Chi Omega, and I think Pi Beta Phi. But they started off with something else, like the uh, Kappa Alpha Theta was known as the Afternoon Tees, uh, and that's how they, and they even had their pictures in, in the yearbook. And, and so if you didn't know that Afternoon Tea actually stood for Alpha Theta, you wouldn't know that that was actually a secret group. Um, so, but, Not very secret if you have your picture in the yearbook. Well, but they didn't list themselves as <laughs> a secret society, so they, um, but about 1915 or 1916, the leaders of those four, um, uh, we call them sororities, mm -hmm. um, uh, decided that they, they, they wanted to make a clean break of this. Uh, 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 president Cantwell had come to campus as a mm -hmm. new president, uh, and they felt it was important for them to kind of, for him to be aware of what was going on. And so they all came together as a collective, I guess, support in numbers, mm -hmm. uh, and appealed to him to kind of over turn that, that secret society oath that people had to take. And then for all those groups, it took several years for them to get nat national affiliation, but then they, they eventually did. So I think 1919 is the official year, 100 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, for those first four groups to, to get started. And those four sororities are still active on campus yes. today. Yes, they still all have chapters on campus, and many of them are celebrating uh, centennials this, this year. So uh, That's it's, uh, very cool. They've, they've lasted quite a while. Great story, David. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about women's history, I think, you know, we're used to hearing a lot about female firsts. So what are some of OSU's female firsts? So uh, we mentioned our first female graduate um, mm -hmm, is uh, Jesse Thatcher Boss. Our first faculty member was Ella Hunter. Mm -hmm. uh, the first faculty member in what now we know as the, as the Spear School of Business, mm -hmm. the first faculty member was a woman. It wasn't a man. Wow. Uh, before it became the School of Commerce, uh, um, Georgina Holt uh, Lewis uh, was their first uh, staff or, or faculty mm -hmm. instructor. Uh, she taught me the clerical uh, skills that people needed to have uh, at that time. Uh, she had that position until she married Lowry Lehman Lewis, who was also on the faculty, and she had to give up her position on the faculty because she was married. Um, and then for 20 or 25 years when they were married, she, she was his spouse. Mm -hmm. um, but then when he passed, they brought her back on the faculty again. She could rejoin. Oh. And so uh, there was, uh, as you can see, there were some issues with... Uh, uh, equal rights. Um, so. And so she was asked to step down not because her husband also worked for the university but simply because, because she had been married. She had been married okay. um, and so you either had to be single or uh, a widow mm -hmm. uh, to be able to work uh, on campus. Uh, some other firsts, um, let's see, uh, Maude Gardner, uh, Maude Gardner Obrecht was the first instructor in, in what we now know as human sciences. Um, and then let's see, Sarah Landis was the first, uh, well she was the head of um, the Department of Domestic Economy, which now we know is Human Sciences, but she was I guess the equivalent of Dean for that. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, Maude Gardner, I'm sorry, um, too many Maudes. Um, Maude Spear was the first uh, female graduate uh, in engineering. She had an architecture and engineering background and our first graduate in engineering in 1915. Um, uh, let's see, Cora Ann Miltmore, who was from the class of 1899, is later hired as our first full-time librarian. Until she is hired, the librarians was kind of a part-time position, mm -hmm. and when she was hired, she was in charge then of, of the library, and that was her exclusive domain. Uh, so, We have a question from William about a different kind of first lady. Um, William wants to know, what roles have first ladies played throughout the years? I know our First cowgirl, Anne Hargis, is very involved on campus. Has that always been the case? Um, their role has grown over time. I really think it was probably um, Henry G. Bennett's wife, uh, Vera, mm -hmm. uh, who, part of because of her longevity, but also she was actively involved in, in, in supporting a number of campus organizations. I think she supported uh, La Homa mm -hmm. uh, when she was here. Uh, she was actively involved with students' uh, lives, and so like if students would show up needing jobs, she would help try to track down jobs for them. She really took an active role um, on campus, um, helping students kind of 
make the transition from their hometowns to, to Stillwater and, and the college. And so I think, I think the, the role of women, uh, the first women, first, first ladies, uh, uh, really begins to shine uh, with, um, with Vera Bennett. Uh, and then, but others uh, have, have been actively involved too. Um, uh, Oliver Wilhelm's wife, uh, yeah. Susan, uh, one, of the, one of our residence halls, which is now gone, but the Wilhelm North and South, Wilhelm, um, I believe it was North, was named for Susan Willem. Uh, Maxine Kamm, uh, wow. Robert Kamm's wife, was also very involved, in, both in, in, in the college, but also in the community. Uh, so there have been a number of women uh, who um, assisted uh, in a, a variety of different roles uh, in, in a number of different ways. Um, I might mention a, a, a more recent uh, first. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our first African-American student uh, was Nancy Randolph Davis. Uh, and so she uh, enrolls here, I think it's late 1949, 1950 or mm -hmm. so. And they recently had a, a statue dedication uh, for her, uh, which is over by the Human Sciences area. But another, another woman's first mm -hmm. uh, on campus. <clears throat> also, um, during uh, like World War I and World War II, uh, when, when there were more men away, it provided an opportunity for more women to take leadership roles. Um, we had women who served also, um, but there were a higher proportion of women on campus. And during those times, they, they stepped up uh, during World War II, uh, the president of the Student Government Association, uh, the editor of the college paper, the editor of the, of the yearbook, the editor of the humor magazine, Aggivator, were all women. Uh, and I think, I think the discovery was, and they knew it was true, but, mm -hmm. but you know, when the men returned, they thought, oh, we can do this as well as you can. So uh, I think those kinds of uh, opportunities, they've, they've availed themselves uh, and have proven themselves quite capable. So. so we had our own academic version of Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> yes, we did. Wonderful. Yes, we did. <laughs> um, so one thing that uh, some of our viewers might not realize is that part of our archives here at OSU is the Oklahoma Women's Archives. So can you tell us a little bit about, first off, why, why do we have the Oklahoma Women's Archives? Why does it live at OSU? And then what, what would we find in the Women's Archives? So beginning several decades ago, we realized that we needed to do a better job of collecting and recording the contributions that women had made, not only mm -hmm. here at OSU, um, but, but locally, regionally, statewide, nationally. Uh, and so we really um, began a more concerted effort to reach out uh, to attract uh, records. Uh, one of our, our largest uh, and, and most worthwhile collections, I believe, is the Angie DeBeau mm -hmm. collection. Uh, Angie DeBeau was an Oklahoma historian, uh, actually she was a national historian, but she's from Oklahoma, uh, who focused on Native American issues uh, and Native American history. Uh, we, we received her collection, uh, so that was one of our early collections that went into the Women's Archive. Mm -hmm. uh, Hannah Diggs Atkins, who was active in, in uh, Oklahoma politics, or I think she was the first African American to, to um, serve in the uh, Oklahoma legislature. Uh, later was appointed by Jimmy Carter to serve in, in the United uh, Nations for a while. Um, but we have her papers. Um, but we, anyway, we began, began exploring the possibility of mm -hmm. bringing those kinds of materials to us. Uh, Jesse Thatcher Bost, uh, also a, a marvelous collection. Uh, 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 Mrs. Bost had collected all of her notes and drawings from when she was a student here. <clears throat> and it really shows exactly what students did. Um, the classes she took, we have her notes. We have the drawings. We have botanical samples that she collected in her botany class. Oh, wow. So it's really a, 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 an exciting collection and, and images uh, also from when she was here. So uh, those are three women that are featured. Um, we've also tried to integrate uh, and make sure we have women's participation in whatever stuff we are collecting. Mm -hmm. More recently, that would be the uh, women's marches, which are occurring on an annual basis. And we're trying to make sure we're collecting materials that uh, represent uh, local and, and national participants uh, in those activities. And so, yeah, hopefully we've tried to, to broaden uh, a, a growing appreciation for the role of women. Mm -hmm. And really our, our Oklahoma Oral Research Program mm -hmm. um, is an outgrowth in many ways of the archives being uh, to attract more uh, women's involvement uh, in things. And so uh, one of our or oral history projects, early ones, was uh, the Dust Bowl Project mm -hmm. where they began to search out uh, and look at uh, women's involvement and women's uh, uh, opinions and views of what they experienced during the Dust Bowl. And, and oral history still does that with their Oklahoma legislative program and, and a number of other uh, themes that they've developed. But it's a way of collecting uh, the input and the contributions of women. Um, and so we're, we're, we are pleased that we're uh, an archive for that. Fantastic, wonderful. Um, okay. Oh, I 
saw a question just come in. Um, this is from Heidi, and she wants to know if you could tell us a little bit about Victory Hall. Victory Hall. I, I'm not sure if she's referring to this or not, but during World War II, most of the fraternities and sororities kind of leased out their, their homes, their, their sorority and fraternity houses, and they became known as Victory Halls. So I'm, I'm hoping, Heidi, this is what you're addressing. Wow. And so what they did is that allowed uh, university or college students to live in the Victory Halls. Uh, and so you had men living in former sororities and, you know, but, but they could live off, kind of off campus, be, be close to campus, that then freed up the residence halls on campus for all the military training programs that were going on. So you had WAVES training here, which mm -hmm. was a women's auxiliary, um, but, but we were one of five uh, training sites uh, for the United States. So we had waves, I think over 11,000 waves came through. Most of them stayed in, in Murray and Willard, I think. Um, but we had other military training programs too. So they could stay on campus for the training programs and the university students then were transferred over, transitioned over to the Victory Halls, which were former fraternities and sororities. And then once the war was over, they went back to the fraternities and sororities. But it was a very uh, generous um, uh, kind of donation on the part of the Greek uh, societies on campus to make their facilities available during the war. Wonderful. Yes, I see here, the rest of the question came through. Could you tell us more about Victory Hall and the Lambda Chi Alpha House during World War II? So, so it was one of the Victory Halls. I think, don't hold me to this, but I think there was like 12 to 15, wow. however many there were on campus at the time for both fraternities and sororities. Uh, I think all of them made themselves available as Victory Halls. And if you go to the yearbooks for those years, uh, they're listed as Victory Hall number one, and, and you'll you know the people who stayed there, and there'll be their pictures in there. So we'll have to look up which one, which, which Victory Hall was the Lambda Chi Alpha House. But I believe the Lambda Chi Alpha House was formerly at one time the Phi Beta, uh, uh, Phi Beta Pi uh, sorority house. We'll check that. Okay, watch in the comments <laughs> for an update. Um, all right, well, I have one last question before we go. Um, if we wanted to learn more about the history of women at OSU, where could we look? So they're welcome to come visit us. We have inventories for all of our collections, including our, our women's collections, and, and all of, of those collections are open to the public, and so we can make those available to you. Uh, we can share the inventory with you beforehand if you want to contact us by email or, or, or phone, but we can provide those inventories. What I would recommend is that everyone, if they have a chance, to look at the Equal Opportunity Book. Uh, by Dr. Pauline Kopecki. Uh, she had written that book as a part of the Oklahoma uh, OSU Centennial History Series. So it's about 20 years, uh, almost 30 years ago, I guess. Um, but it's an excellent resource looking at a number of, of equal opportunity issues uh, regarding the campus, but specifically uh, there's a number of, of leads as to uh, the role that women have played and the opportunities that women have had on campus and the sources that she used. Most of those we have in, in the archives. In fact, I think all of them we, have, we should have in the archive. Uh, but there's also information available uh, online through our digital collections. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, our WAVES cards, though those aren't actually OSU students, but, but there are women who served here. Mm -hmm. We have their cards. We have the Secrets of the Century cards. These were uh, little notes that people had written over 50 years ago uh, at the 50th anniversary celebrations. And, and many of those women are writing notes to their children and grandchildren, and so we have those. Uh, the college papers have been digitized, and so they can do searches for uh, groups, individuals, names, or whatever, and see if they pop up there. Uh, also, the yearbooks have been digitized. And so there's, there's a number of layers of information mm -hmm. depending on how much work they want to do. And we should have most of that either available through our uh, uh, digital resources or through uh, the archives department at the east end of the second floor of the OSU library. This episode was part of the Archives Live, a monthly video broadcast. Watch the broadcast and stay in touch with the archives by liking and following the Oklahoma State University Archives Facebook page. Find a link to the page in the show notes. This episode featured Bonnie Kane Wood and David Peters, hosted by Nina Thornton and produced by Samantha Mackey. Theme music is It's a Process, composed by Ben Stone and Finley Green and published by BBC Production Music PRS. From the folks at Oklahoma State University Libraries and the Archives, thanks for listening. And always remember to keep your archival material flat, cool, and acid-free.